tonight. Um, I know we don't have a lot of participants right now, but it is noon and others will be joining us as we go along. But we wanted to begin our presentation for today. We have Alexandra Gazowski from HMFH, who is going to be doing a presentation on collaborating to achieve sustainability goals. The presentation will run about 45 minutes. If anybody has any questions they want to ask, if you could put them in the chat, that would be great. And then Alexandra can take questions um, after the presentation. We would like to ask that we maintain a timetable of 1 p.m. as we know people's time is valuable and we try not to run over that time. So we just want to ask that people are respectful of that. Um, Alexandra, uh, if you would like to take over, we are ready to learn about sustainability. Thank you. And thank you so much, Tracy and Patty, for inviting me here today. It's fantastic to um, be able to share this topic with your group. Um, so I'd like to start off just briefly by talking about why is it important that we're having this conversation? Um, you know, I think there are a lot of big picture wise here, um, you know, I think we've all heard about the urgency related to climate change, topics around material health and the impact on humans. We understand we spend a great deal of our time indoors and so our buildings impact us hugely. I think every year we're getting more and more knowledgeable about the impacts of our choices, both in our personal lives and our professional lives. And the more we know, I think the more it's incumbent on us to apply what we're learning to our work. Um, and from, you know, a more personalist perspective, um, you know, why are we considering sustainability in our work? Um, you know, I work at a firm that primarily designs schools. And so we are designing buildings for children. I have a colleague who I'm, I'm going to borrow this phrase from, but often says children are not little adults and they respond and are highly impacted by their environment. So on a, a personal why, um, you know, that's one of the reasons this topic is very important to me, but no matter what kind of work you're doing, whether you're working in housing or healthcare, um, and, you know, I know we have people from different backgrounds, architecture, engineering, I'm sure you can all come up with some, some reasons why, um, you know, sustainability is very important to you and the work that you're doing every day. Um, so, I think, you know, we, we start with the why, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about goal setting, because I think that's, you know, really important. Um, you know, there are, there are many frameworks that we can use for goal setting, um, and I would encourage you to think about what might be appropriate for the work you do, but today I'd like to focus on the five topic areas or buckets that are defined by the AIA Materials Pledge, um, because I think these can be applied beyond materials when you're designing and they provide an excellent holistic framework when you're thinking about sustainability. You know, in order to improve the built environment, we need to set goals and we need to have associated metrics that allow us to understand our impact and know if we're meeting those goals. Um, you know, I think aligning these goals across disciplines and having that collaboration amplifies our impact and allows us to achieve bigger sustainability with goals than we would otherwise. Um, so, you know, in this roundtable atmosphere, I think it's really interesting to think about how everyone, no matter what role they play in the design process, um, how we can unite everyone behind common goals um, so that everyone feels like they're really participating and moving the needle on sustainability in, this, in, in these projects. Um, so I think this AI materials pledge framework is fantastic and I just like to talk through these five buckets briefly. Um, so the first one is human health. So the AI says we can support human health by preferring products that support and foster life throughout their life cycles and seek to eliminate the use of hazardous substances. Um, so no matter where you are in the project chain, I'd encourage you to think about um, how you can be doing this. What labels can you be asking for? For example, looking for declare labels or health product declarations. Um, and um, perhaps considering red list free products. Um, you know, I think we think a lot about the human health of the end occupants of our building, but I'd also encourage everyone when they're, when they're thinking about sustainability and goal setting to consider the entire life cycle. So that's, you know, our materials from the point of extraction into 
into our buildings and into our designs, and then right through their use phase and their end of life. So where do things come from and where are they gonna go? Um, because while something might be very benign for the occupants of our building, it could have a human health impact somewhere else along the supply chain, someone who lives near a point of extraction or um, you know, a manufacturing facility. And I think PVC, for example, is a good, um, a good case study when thinking about life cycle impacts. So we also want to think about supporting climate health by thinking about how we can reduce carbon emissions in our building. And ultimately, we want to be sequestering more carbon than we're using. So this could be thinking about how we can look at um, recycled content, things that are sequestering carbon, um, and where our products are coming from. We also want to support ecosystem health by preferring products that support and regenerate natural air, water, and biological substance of life throughout the entire supply chain. Um, for example, we might be thinking about products that have low volatile organic compounds, or um, could we be using fewer paints or coatings? Because while those things and end products might not be impacting our users, is there a point in the production where this is having an impact? For example, spraying paint could be impacting an ecosystem. Um, we also want to consider um, social health and equity by preferring products from manufacturers that has secured human rights in their operations and supply chains and are positively impacting workers and the communities they operate. Um, so this could be thinking about, um, for example, asking for products from manufacturers have, that have a just label, which reports on diversity, inclusion, equity, um, employee benefits, employee health, stewardship, um, and the product supply chain. Um, and lastly, we want to be considering a circular economy when we're setting our sustainability goals. So we want to think about reusing and improving buildings designed for resiliency, adaptability, disassembly, and reuse, and aspiring ultimately to have a zero waste goals. Um, so I think here there's a lot of important questions we can ask about how the things that we're putting into our buildings can be recycled, reused, or updated. Um, so that they have a better end of life story. So those are some background um, goal setting frameworks. Um, and I think we're all sort of familiar. We have this kickoff, this very exciting point at the start of a project where we're coming up with our, with our goals. And I think for a long time, we, we might have siloed our sustainability goals. So, you know, we'd have our project goals. This could be programmatic. This could be design related. You know, we, we would have a meeting with the client, maybe multiple meetings, and we come up with, with those big picture project goals. And then we might have, a, you know, a separate sustainability goal setting meeting or a charrette. Um, and what I'd really like to encourage everyone to think about as you're bringing your teams together is how this can really just be, you know, project goals and have sustainability completely integrated and integral into that process. So as we're bringing the team together, this is something that's really baked into every aspect of how we're talking about the project. Because I think when we, when we have this model where we're, we're siloing these two goals, um, we could end up with sustainability goals that are um, essentially sort of perceived as, as additive. They're you know, put on top of our design. And as everyone has probably had some experiences with um, you know, value engineering, everything that's not you know, really core to the project there's opportunities all along the design process for those things to be cut. So I think we wanna just be considering sustainability as something that's completely baked in right from the very beginning, right from that first kickoff. And we wanna everyone on the team um, to be really on board with that and embracing these goals um, in all aspects of the work. Um, so, you know, we probably everyone has heard of, um, you know, this, um, framework for social, environmental, economic. Um, and these are great lenses to look at sustainability goals. Um, and we'd like to sort of encourage you to perhaps see a model where you're looking at the social, environmental, economic, and design goals as one, as one framework. Um, and if you can get a goal that's hitting all four of those sort of um, points or lenses, those seem like goals that you're going to have success carrying throughout your whole project. So if you come up with a goal that's fantastic for the environment, 
um, you know, it, it aligns with your design aesthetic, it's got a positive social impact, and it's just something that's going to be economically unfeasible at some point, you know, that's, that's likely going to be cut out of your project. And, you know, if you have, um, you know, something that's, that's, that's only hitting one or two, under two of these buckets, those are the things that we think are gonna be cut. So we really wanna consider all of these lenses when we're setting our goals to ensure that we're gonna have things that we're able to keep throughout our entire design process and into construction. Um, so this I think is a, a great round table um, because we, I understand we have people from all different backgrounds here. So I'd like you to sort of consider your projects and consider what goes into into your building? How many products are going into a building? How many hundreds or thousands of things? Um, you know, we've got the, the big things that we might be thinking of, our brick, our flooring, our tiles, the things that have an aesthetic impact, but also the things that we might be thinking about a little bit less, the glue, the tape, the insulation. You know, and we've got hundreds of design details um, and you know, every detail and every product specification provides us with an opportunity to shift the needle on sustainability. Every little detail, you know, every, every product, we can pick a more holistically sustainable choice. Um, and ultimately these things are gonna aggregate and we're gonna have, um, you know, better buildings that are supporting our big aims. I also like to think as we're thinking about all those details and materials, who specifies them? So, you know, I'm coming from an architecture background, and I think perhaps architecture school teaches us that architects have a lot of control in the design process, but really these buildings are created by, by huge teams. Um, and if we don't have, you know, everyone who's on these team on board with our goals, we're missing huge opportunities. You know, we want, we want every discipline um, to be engaging and moving these big ideas forward. You know, so we, we've talked about the kickoff meeting, we have all these people together. Um, and, you know, I think we're used to perhaps um, focusing our goals around super discipl um, specific disciplines. For example, we might be used to talking to um, a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer about goals around um, EUI and energy use. But I'd like you to, if we think back to that, um, the five buckets we were talking about, you know, talk to your mechanical engineer about human health. Are there red list materials in the products they're, they're specifying? Um, do we know where those products are coming from? Um, are there materials or chemicals that could be harmful to human health? You know, have you ever asked your um, you know, fire protection engineer, what is the embodied carbon impact of all this metal that you're putting into our building? And are there different choices we can be making? Are there different products we can be looking at? Are there different layouts? Um, you know, where are things coming from? What is the shipping impact? Um, because I think we, we really want everyone who's, who's working on the design to be engaging with those five buckets and considering how we can um, improve. So I'd like to talk through um, one case study today, um, which is related to lighting, but I think could be applied to any of the disciplines we were just, we were just looking at and talk about how some big picture goals can be translated into one, um, one discipline. So for this case study project, I'd like to focus on an example, which is a, an, a large public high school. So this project is related, is located in Massachusetts um, and the community is really excited about it. They want this to be, um, you know, a, a flagship building, which encompasses, um, their vision for education, and it's going to be one of the, the largest new buildings in the town. So there's a lot of enthusiasm around this. Um, and so we're going to kick off this process with a goal setting. Um, charrette. So we bring all of the community together and we're going to talk through this framework. So in the previous example, we had had environmental, economic, and social sustainability. Um, and today, because this is a case study related to school, we're also going to look at all of our goals through the educational lens. So we want everything that we're doing to be supporting core programming of this building. Um, and after this, this goal setting threat, we've come up with um, seven goals. So we want to have a site design that supports 
um, protecting the natural environment, supporting um, you know, saving existing trees when possible, highlighting existing wetland, wetlands, um, having engagement between the um, interior and exterior, um, you know, and looking at biophilic design. We want to have a well daylit building wherever possible. Um, you know, schools are a program that supports that really well because our primary hours of occupancy are, you know, 8 a.m. to, to 3 p.m. Um, so how can we maximize our use of daylight and mi minimize our use of artificial lighting? We want to think about material transparency. Um, this is um, a big topic to tackle. So we're going to focus in on our interior touch surfaces. So the, the products and areas that people are going to be engaging with most directly. We want to have an efficient design. So when we're looking at the big picture layout of the building, we want it to be efficient. Um, we want to think about how we can be um, using our finishes and our materials in a way um, that's effective and we're not overusing um, additional um, surfaces, um, which has um, you know, benefits in all four of these sectors. We want to design a building that's future proof. There's so much, um, you know, where we talked about climate change, we can talk about new legislation that's coming into Massachusetts. So we want to design something that's going to be robust and respond to changing conditions over the whole lifetime of the building. Um, we want the building to be a teaching tool so that when people come in, um, they can learn about the building function, the sustainability attributes, and that can be integrated into the curriculum. And we also want to think about ways that we can be reducing operational and embodied carbon. So after the, you know, all of the discussions, hearing what everyone was excited about, um, those are sort of the seven goals that we felt really um, met the four lenses that we're reviewing. Um, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about how those goals can be applied um, to lighting. And the, you know, the lighting is going to be the focus of the case study, but I think it would also be useful, um, you know, to think how these could be applied to, um, you know, mechanical, plumbing, fire protection, um, you know, any of the, the disciplines that going, go into pulling our designs together. Um, so the first one we want to talk about is daylighting. Um, the students are going to spend a large chunk of this day in the building, and we want to be designing our classrooms so that they're optimized for daylight. Um, we're going to be thinking about the orientation of our building. We're going to be thinking about shading devices. Um, we're going to think about which wall could be most appropriate for the teaching wall so that we're minimizing glare. We're going to be looking at our, our finished material so that we have a high light reflectance value. Um, so daylight is an important part of these educational goals. Um, our site goals also heavily overlap with um, our educational goals. Um, we want to think how the students can be, can be accessing the outdoors. Um, you know, we have opportunities through the science curriculum, through the physical education curriculum. Um, you know, and other opportunities. So how can we design a building that facilitates that? Um, and lastly, from the lighting perspective, we, how can we think about all the different programs um, and all the different space types ranging from typical classrooms to science rooms, tech rooms, gyms, and light these in a way that is um, completely appropriate for the use. We don't wanna be over lighting spaces. Um, we don't want students to be dealing with glare. Um, and those, those levels range by program. So I want to start off by talking about these very specific educational goals because this is foundational to all the work that we do. Um, and then I'm gonna move into talking about, um, oh, sorry, going the wrong way here. Um, next, I wanna talk about um, efficient design. So I think we all know in our personal personal lives, the efficiency is one of the uh, sort of low hanging fruit when it comes to sustainability, because the easiest way to minimize our impact is to use fewer resources. You know, in, in a personal level, this could be as easy as bringing a reusable shopping, shopping bag to the grocery store. Um, but this sort of same mindset can be applied to our designs. Um, so when we're thinking about lighting, we want to think, when can we have exposed um, finishes? When can we use um, minimal materials that we feel comfortable are exposing? 
Um, for example, skipping additional paintings and coatings and let the base material be visible. Um, we also want to think about how we can really optimize layouts so the design is providing appropriate lighting levels without installing unnecessary products. Um, and I think this um, uh, this topic of efficiency is one that's really um, easy to translate between all of the different disciplines. Um, so next, I wanted to talk about operational carbon. Um, so this touches on a number of um, the buckets in the AIA materials pledge. I think one of the things that's important to understand when you're thinking about this is to understand your location. There's lots of really interesting uh, information available about carbon intensity in the different grids. Um, you can see in Massachusetts, we are um, below the US average, but we are substantially above other states. Um, a lot of towns and municipalities, as well as Massachusetts, is um, you know, planning for a, a lower carbon grid, but we're not there right yet. So we really need to consider that mix when we're designing our buildings. Um, I would say this is an area where it's particularly important to set goals early because these um, lowering operational carbon um, can have big impacts on your envelope. It can have big impacts on all of the designs of your system. And the earlier that these goals are set and conveyed to all of the disciplines and the consultants, um, the easier it is to minimize the cost impact. If we're doing this later in the process, um, it will likely have higher uh, financial impacts. Um, so for this project, as an example, we've set an EUI target of 25, which is gonna be supported by a light power density target of 0 0.4, because we want to be ready for that net zero future. Um, so we want to be pu pushing um, energy use down as low as possible so that in the future, if there's an opportunity to offset um, energy use with renewables, we can minimize the size of the system that we would be required to use. Um, so operational and embodied carbon um, have an extremely close connection. So on the previous slide, we were looking at the embodied carbon in the grid. Um, if you were, for example, doing a project that was located in an area with um, lower embodied carbon in the mix that's coming into your building, you might be looking at, at embodied carbon a little bit differently because it's going to be substantially more impactful. So these things, um, you really need to be looking at operational embodied carbon together and weighing them to get a sense of the overall carbon impacts of your building. So in this particular case study, we're looking at an example of a school. Um, and we want to set some benchmarks so we can gauge our performance. Like this is an area where we really need to continue to ask for more information. Um, there is very little benchmarking available in the North American context. The Carbon Leadership Forum has done some fantastic work. Um, but for this example, we're going to look at um, information that comes from the London Energy and Transport and transportation initiative because their benchmarking for schools includes MEP. Um, often when life cycle assessment is done, which is where we're getting our, our benchmarks, um, it's a core and shell credit. It's a, a core and shell focus, which people are doing to align with the lead credit. So we're not including all of the disciplines. Um, so we really wanna push for having the information to do a holistic life cycle assessment because right now we're limited in our ability to understand the full impacts of what we're designing. Um, so in this particular example, um, we're setting a thousand kilograms CO2 as our benchmark for this building. And when we're breaking down MEP into electrical and lighting, we're seeing that lighting might be responsible for about 1% of that embodied carbon impact. And that might seem like a small proportion of the total, but if we want to, for example, on this project, really reduce our embodied carbon by 40%, we're gonna have some big wins, perhaps associated with structure, but we're gonna need to aggregate all of the little wins and we're gonna need everyone who's working on this building to think about what, how they're designing and what they're specifying um, and how we can reduce the embodied carbon there. Um, because 40% is a very ambitious target. 
Um, but we need to have really ambitious um, targets related to carbon because we all know the negative impacts that it's having. Next, we wanna talk about material health. Um, so when we're thinking about material health, we would optimally be looking at um, declare labels indicating red list free is our highest material health goal. I think this is true for lighting, but I would say that I would recommend that as a good baseline for all the products that are going into your buildings. Um, there's been a huge increase in material transparency over the last year, but it's still not at a level where on a public project, it's easy to find three equals with transparency to closure for all the products that you're going into our buildings. So we do as well need to continue to advocate for this transparency. Um, you know, because until we have a critical mass of products with this information, we're limited in our ability to make informed choices about what we're specifying, and we're able to make this a requirement for all the products that go into our buildings. Um, you know, I'd love if we re could require red list free products for everything that goes into our projects, but we're not quite there. Um, so in this example, I'd like to think about how we can focus on the most commonly used product types. Here we're looking at fixture types. And for a school, the most common products um, would be the classroom fixture and the hallway fixture, which often come from the same family. So looking back at previous projects, um, this could easily account for 70% of what we're specifying for lighting on the project. So this is a really great place to start. because I think you might think focusing on one product um, might not have a big impact, but we all have things that we specify frequently and represent a large portion of what goes into our work. So if we can really optimize what we're selecting for these common products, um, we have a real opportunity to move the needle when it comes to material health. Um, you know, and I think to get into the, without getting too far into details, we really need to think about how we can be formalizing these requirements in our specifications and on our drawings so that we can um, translate our big ambitions into our final projects like constructed. Um, so, um, you know, this was um, very specific to lighting, but I think in these four impact categories, there's some things that we can take and translate to whatever area you're working in. So for embodied carbon, we want to be asking for environmental product decorations, which is ultimately going to allow us to conduct full building life cycle assessments. Um, and we want to be thinking about how we can have really efficient designs. For operational carbon, we want to be setting EUI targets and light power density targets early in the project um, and conveying these across our full project team. For material health, we want to be asking for declare labels and prioritizing products that are red list free and specific to this project, but no matter what area you're working in, I'm sure that you could come up with some um, program specific goals. Here we're talking about daylighting, exterior connection, and supporting the program with appropriate lighting. Um, so I'd like to sort of step back and set some, some big picture goals for successful collaboration when we're talking about sustainability. So I think one of the most important things is to set the goals really early, to have that, um, that visioning session where we're talking holistically about all our project goals and really baking in what we want to do with sustainability. And we want to convey those goals across the entire project team. And going back sort of a step further, I think we want to make sure we want to be thinking about our sustainability objectives as we're assembling our project teams. You know, ideally, every person um, and every you know company who's brought on board would share a very similar vision and a commitment to sustainability, um, so that that everyone is is really. Um, big picture aligned in the way that they're thinking about this topic. We want to really specifically, once we've conveyed our goals, assign responsibility um, so that everyone knows how their specific portion of the work is contributing to these larger goals that we have. And we want to have tracking metrics. People say all the time, it's, it's you know, you can't improve where you're, where you're not tracking. So we want everyone to have specific um, metrics and associated documentation. So to say, you know, we want to have a building that 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 uses less energy um, is a really amorphous goal. 
you know, we want to set something specific. We want to be hitting an EUI target of 20. We want to be 40% better than code, and we're going to provide this documentation. So that as we're working through our design iterations, we can see um, what we need to change, what we can improve, um, you know, and, and, and how we can track that through our various iterations. Um, I think it's also important that we can um, utilize the specific knowledge of all the disciplines involved. You know, we, we hire all of these experts in their own areas so they, that they can contribute to creating better buildings. Um, and so part of that, I think, is really educating ourselves around our sustainability objectives so that when we're in these meetings, we have the ability to ask, um, you know, pointed and specific questions to move these topics forward. Um, you know, I've, I've told this um, anecdote before, so the people here in my office might have heard it, but, you know, I was at a conference a few years ago on embodied carbon and I was sitting next to a structural engineer and we'd listened to this presentation about, um, you know, these very innovative low embodied carbon structural systems. And he said, I really wish that architects would ask me to do interesting work and innovative designs like this when they hire me. And I was almost speechless because I had sort of thought, you know, it sort of goes without saying, right, that everyone is going to bring all of their knowledge and all of their innovation to the table. But I think, um, you know, that was a few years ago and I've, I've thought about it more and I've been involved in, in more and larger projects. I think, and you know, this is the project management roundtable, so I'd be interested when we get into the questions if people have ideas, but I think there's a lot that goes into setting up a team and making people feel um, comfortable and engaged and like they have an opportunity to bring um, all of their big ideas to the table. Um, so I think there's a lot that can go into creating that atmosphere. Um, and I think often it requires having the ability to ask specific enough questions that you can bring that information out. Um, because we need everyone, everyone to be bringing their big ideas around sustainability to the table because we, we have to make huge changes in the built environment to hit the goals um, that we need. Um, so I'd like to, you know, we've been talking about this on a project scale, but I think uh, we also need to think that this, um, you know, issues related to sustainability and climate change um, are not something that we can solve one building at a time. You know, we've talked through design examples today, but I really want to emphasize that this, you know, is something where we need to think larger at the community scale and the different district scale um, and the advocate and the, the scale of advocacy. Um, you know, we, we are all, I think, pushing towards these goals on our design project, but we need to push for policies and an industry-wide focus, not just on sustainability, but on regenerative practices and consider how we can leave things better than we found them. I um, mean, you know, I think Massachusetts um, is one of the most forward-thinking States, so we have a lot of like-minded people pushing this, these issues forward, which is fantastic. Um, but we, you know, we we still have a lot of of um, work to do when it comes to sustainability. Um, so I'm going to share one example, just because I've talked talked about lighting. We've talked about the AA Materials Pledge. Um, you know, I want to talk about the Lighting Advocacy Letter briefly as an example. Um, so this letter is hosted on Mindful Materials. Um, and it outlines the sort of five buckets of the AI materials pledge, and it's directed to manufacturers and says, and says you know, this is very important. Um, and there's close to 70 firms signed on to this. I believe there's close to 100 firms signed on to the AI materials pledge. And I think this is really important because if I'm as an individual and I go to a, you know, product rep and I say, you know, on my, my one building here, you know, I would like red list free tile. Um, and they're like, well, you know, this one person doing kind of a, a mid-size, mid-budget project, this is important to them, but, you know, how impactful is that? But if we can get, you know, 70 or 100 or 200 firms saying these topics are really important to us and we can go to manufacturers 
um, and product reps and say, there's a huge demand for your product. I think that's when we really have opportunities to change what's available. Um, so that was, you know, a lighting related example. Um, there's a structural engineering pledge. Um, there's recently been an MEP pledge, the Carbon Leadership Forum. Um, there's, if you go to mindful materials, there's an owner's pledge, a manufacturer's pledge. Um, and these are really opportunities for people to sort of um, unite behind these big ideas and shift the market. So I'd encourage you both to think about how we can collaborate on our project teams to create better, better buildings and how we can really collaborate together with, with designers at, at other firms to, to impact some big, big, big picture change in the built environment. Um, um, so, I really appreciate everyone sort of um, listening to my presentation. I got through that a little bit faster than I was expecting, but um, would love to hear any comments or, or questions. No, nobody has any questions. <laughs> Hi, Alexandra. Uh, Matt Root from IES, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. I, I, I'm just curious, could you talk a little bit about what are, I, I guess, the, the obstacles that you see in trying to set goals early in the process? And also, if you could talk a little bit about the balance of kind of big, inspiring goals versus kind of nitty gritty goals. I mean, you've got like the EUI of 25 and then the lighting power density and how do you, how do you balance how many goals to have? Thank you. Um, sure, thanks Matt. So that's such a, those are such, so big questions. I'm trying to think how to start here. Um, you know, I think the question of specificity is, I'm, I'm gonna maybe start there because I think, you know, you, you have these visioning sessions and those tend to be very, very big, maybe pie in the sky, sky goals, right? Um, and that's really exciting. And I think that's where you want projects to start off. You don't want someone to come to a goal setting session and say, you know what, I really want a building that has six inches of insulation. You know, I've, that's, that's too pragmatic. That's not, that's not how we get people excited about, you know, these fantastic new projects we're starting. Um, so I think, we, we do want to start big picture. And I think then the, you know, the design team wants to, to sit down with those, with those big picture goals and translate them into sort of specific, um, you know, more specific goals that are associated with numbers and tracking metrics and documentation. And, you know, think about how those, those requirements are really going to translate into our, our drawings and our specifications. Because ultimately, if we want, we want these big picture goals to be translated into something that's going to be built. We have to think about how, how we're documenting it. And, um, you know, hopefully I think that process would be done. I feel like I've said collaboration a lot, but with, with all the parties at the table, because people have so much discipline specific knowledge. And I think it's really a matter of how we can tap into that. And, you know, I don't know everyone's background on the call today. Um, but, you know, if you have a, you know, a mechanical engineer who says we could really be way more efficient if we, you know, I know for your design, you'd like to push all the mechanical rooms to the side, but I think we could use, you know, 10% less material if we could, you know, have a hub in the middle of the building, so much less duct work. Um, so we really need to have, have that communication when we're, when we're setting up our goals, because it's, you know, as you get onto these projects, it's impossible to know everything. And so you really want to be relying on, on your, on your collaborators and on your, your team who has, you know, the, the very important, um, you know, background. And I think, um, you know, we have these big picture goals and, and the big moves that we can make in our building, but in the same way, you know, we have the big goals and the, the details. Um, I think you want everyone on your team, if they're doing 
you know, big design moves or small little detailing to feel invested in the goals and understand that, you know, you could be detailing a window and that might seem, um, I don't know, maybe like a little bit of a mundane task, but that can have a huge impact on the performance of the building and, and the overall sustainability. So, you know, no, no matter what you're working on, no matter what, you know, drawing your assigned, the work that you're doing is feeding into that big picture. So we, um, you know, I think we want to convey that across all our disciplines, but also in our, our internal teams that, that everyone is, is impacting this. So I hope that wasn't too roundabout. And I'm sorry, I think you had sort of three questions. I hope I didn't miss one of them there, Matt. Well, just about, no, that, that's helpful. And, and, you know, my big takeaway there is just the importance of, of teamwork, right, and collaboration. Um, and, and getting a team that works well together. Um, I, I think my, my other question was just about like hurdles and, and what are the big challenges that you uh, encounter in trying to set ambitious goals? So I, I think there's, there's two hurdles I would see if I was breaking it out. You know, I think um, the first one is, is cost. And I think we've all, we've all run into that on our projects. And I think, um, you know, a lot of these, there's, I think firstly, I'd say that there's um, a good body of research that says if we set our, our goals early and we've really integrate our sustainability goals holistically into our building, that minimizes the cost impact. So I think that's really important. We want to do it early. Um, but with a, I think it's also important to say that, um, you know, certain measures might have a higher upfront cost and then they're going to reduce your operational costs. Um, you know, so for example, installing PV, installing, you know, more insulation and having a better thermal performance, while you might have a small upfront cost, you know, you, you are going to be lowering your energy bills for the, the whole lifetime of the building. So I think getting people to step back and not just look at the construction costs, but look at the, the ongoing cost of, of operating their building over the next, you know, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. And, you know, Massachusetts is so, um, I think, progressive. I think one of the sort of top five states when we're talking about, you know, big picture goals around, um, you know, net zero. And, you know, if we're, we're moving into a world that's going to be all electric, um, you know, I think it's important for people to understand what the, the ramifications for that might be. Perhaps that's going to be a little bit of an upfront cost now, but does that mean in 10 years you're not going to be having to do a retrofit to your systems? Um, so I think it can be be difficult to have to have those longer term conversations about costs and for everyone to get their head around that. And I think part of the barrier there is that it can often be a different person paying the construction costs than paying the operational costs. So those benefits might not be as directly connected as we would like them to be. Um, and I think the other barrier to our big sustainability goals is that we often don't have easy access to the information we would need to make really informed decisions um, about the, the work that we're doing. Um, you know, we, we want, in an ideal world, I would love to have a declare label that says my product is red list free. I would have an environmental product declaration, which gives me good information about the embodied carbon and all the environmental impacts. And I was able to get a just label from the manufacturer, which gives me the information about that company. So I'm sort of hitting, you know, my climate health, my human health, the social justice. Um, and we really don't have that information um, for a big chunk of what we're specifying. Um, so, you know, we, we do the best we can. We, we keep asking for that information. because I think that that sort of consistent ask is really important, but um, you know, that's, we, we really need that information to know that we're making choices that support our goals and we're not quite there yet. Thank you, Alexander. Thanks for the presentation. Does anybody have any other questions or um, comments for Alexandra? Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today and especially Alexandra. It was a wonderful presentation and hopefully everybody got something out of it and it benefited you. Um, but, okay. 
So if anybody does have any questions, this, the presentation was recorded. So I'm happy to send that out once it's available, or you can go onto the BSA website and um, you can get it from there. But again, I want to take the time to thank everybody. And um, hopefully we will see you at the next BSA Project Management Roundtable in a couple of months. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you Bye. Thank you.